Well, good morning. I love that, that line, and Jesus on my cross have taken, where he says, he says that Jesus died to win me. And when I think about that, it, it blows me away that he wanted to win me. There's nothing, nothing great in winning me. In fact, I would say it's, it's, it's a loss for the regular guy. But Jesus died to win me, and if you know him, he has died to win you. Uh, and I remember the first time I heard that in the song, I was just weeping, singing there, like, why would he want to win me? But he did. And he wants to win you. If he hasn't won you already, maybe he wants to win you still. Yeah. So it's the great hope of the faith that he would want us. Well, we will be looking at um, Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 to 11. Please turn there, if you will. We'll be looking at the church of Smyrna. As I said, I'm, going to, I'm doing a seven sermon series on the seven churches, the seven letters to the seven churches in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. And today we'll look at verses 8 through 11. And there we read in chapter 2 of Revelation, And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last, who was dead, and came to life. I know your works, tribulation, and poverty, but you are rich. I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Let's pray. O oh Lord and our God, we come before you, Lord, needy in every way. But even now, particularly, Lord, to open up our minds and our hearts to hear the word of God and to receive it. Uh, Lord, to believe what is absolutely true and right. Uh, and Lord, to be moved by it. Not to just agree with it, but Lord, that it would change us. Or that it would be, uh, Lord, what our lives were, were grounded in and lived by. And so please help me to be able to preach it uh, with truth and passion. Lord, please help us to hear it and to live it. That you would be glorified because of it. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Well, last week we looked at the letter to the church at Ephesus, which was the first of the seven. We saw that they did a lot of really good things, and I gave you the analogy of a report card. If, if you had a report card with eight, eight different uh, grades on it, they would have had seven A pluses and one big fat D minus. And that was because they had left their first love, uh, which we said was their love for Christ. And Jesus counseled them. He said to remember where they had fallen from, to repent of their sin, and then to return and do the first works. Well, today we're going to look at the letter to the church at Smyrna. And the church at Smyrna didn't leave their first love, but they were a suffering church. And they were a persecuted church. Now, the city of Smyrna was about 40 miles north of Ephesus, and it was a really prosperous city. Uh, a population of about maybe 100,000 people, which would have been a lot. It was called the Crown City because it was surrounded by hills that resembled a crown, which will come into play a little bit later on. Uh, and, and the city, its own motto of the city was first in Asia in size and beauty because it was a big and a beautiful city. And it was famous for the production of myrrh, uh, which is a fragrance that comes from the gum of a shrub-like tree. And myrrh was used as a perfume for the living and used as an embalming agent for the dead. Remember when the wise men, uh, uh, they come to a, a, a young Jesus uh, in Bethlehem and they bring him three gifts. They bring him gold, frankincense, and they bring him myrrh. Uh, and myrrh represents, or represented his suffering and death. Gold representing that he was a king, frankincense rec uh, representing that he was a priest, and myrrh that he would die, he would suffer and die. Uh, and when he did die, we remember that Joseph of Arimathea with Nicodemus, they anoint his body for burial using myrrh. So myrrh was an expensive perfume used in life and used in death. 
uh, which Smyrna produced. Now the name Smyrna actually means myrrh. And myrrh actually means bitterness. And we will see that out of the bitter suffering of the saints in Smyrna, this, what came from that was the sweet fragrance and aroma of Christ. Now, religiously speaking, Smyrna was, was the center of, of, of the worship of Caesar, actually. Back in uh, 195 BC, a temple was built there to Dea Roma, or to the Rome god, or uh, Rome the god. And at that point, the people actually worshipped Rome as a god. Later on, over time, the worship of Rome would become the worship of the Caesar, or the emperor. And in John's day, uh, Domitian was the Caesar, and he had launched a, an extensive persecution against the church, which certainly the city of Smyrna felt with, with great uh, struggle. Uh, and so with that short background, there's a lot more, but to get with that short background, I want to look at this suffering church using a three-point outline. If you have a bulletin, it'll be on the back of that bulletin. If you don't have a bulletin, raise your hand, and I think we'll get you one. And the three points are the comfort for Smyrna, the caution for Smyrna, and thirdly, the charge to Smyrna. And let me read verses 8 and 9 again for the comfort for them. And there we read, To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation, and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, uh, but are a synagogue of Satan. So Jesus addresses the angel. And we said last week the angel being addressed in each of the letters is the pastor of the church or the elders of the church. And then he describes himself as the first and the last, the one who was dead and then came to life. Uh, and both of these would have been a great comfort to the church at that time, in any church. For one declares his deity, and the other declares his humanity. In Revelation chapter 1, verses 17 and 18, he said both of these things concerning himself to John. He said, do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I live, I am alive forevermore. And the first and the last is a title that God used for himself three times in the book of Isaiah. And what it basically means is, I'm the eternal one. I'm the self-existent one. I am the I am. And what Jesus is saying when he uses it, he's saying, I am God. I am God. I am the I am, he's saying. Uh, and therefore, because he is the first and the last, he is in control even over their trials and their sufferings. And when he says, I was dead and came to life, he's speaking of his humanity and, 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 and his victory over sin and death as a man. The same victory the saints at Smyrna will one day experience. Well, the first two words of verse 9 would have been another great comfort to these suffering saints when he says, I know. I know. I know what you do. I know how you've been faithful to me. I know what you're going through. I know what you're suffering, and I know where your suffering is coming from. And in the midst of severe trials and sufferings, it is easy to think Jesus doesn't know. Right? It is easy to think when things aren't going my way, when you're going through trials and struggles and all kinds of issues, it is easy to think he doesn't care, he doesn't know. And if he does know, he's not doing anything about it. But he does know, and he does care. Well, then he names specific things that he knows. He says, I know your works, or I know your labor. I know what you do. I know what you do in my name. I know your commitment to my gospel. I know those things. And then he says, I know your tribulation. And the word tribulation literally means to be crushed beneath a weight, to be heavily pressured by a weight. And their tribulation is that they were suffering because they were Christians. So Jesus knows that the Gentiles are persecuting them, and he knows that the Jews are persecuting them too, which he will talk about in a minute. Why? For their testimony of the gospel. He knows they're suffering physically. He knows they're suffering financially. He knows they're suffering emotionally because of their faith in Christ. So he knows that. He knows their works. He knows their tribulations. Then he says, I know your poverty. I know your poverty. You know what the word poverty means here? Abject poverty. Severe poverty. It means destitute. It means you don't have two nickels to rub together. Odds are they were dirt poor because of their stand for Christ. Listen, Smyrna was a very wealthy city, yet the Christians there were impoverished. And they may have been so because, uh, because they wouldn't yield. Therefore, people there wouldn't employ them. 
or they wouldn't sell to them, or they wouldn't buy their goods. In other words, they were boycotted. Thus, they were financially persecuted. And in some countries, if someone claims Christ as their Lord and Savior, they are cut off from making a living in that land. They are shunned by the merchants of that place. And laws are passed in those places to financially oppress them. And like the saints in Revelation 10.34, some of them had their goods plundered. So the church in Smyrna was a poor church. And there was no welfare, there was no SSI, there was no food stamps, there was no Obamacare to help them. They just lived in deep poverty. And listen, being a Christian will often cost you. I remember the very first Wednesday night Bible study prayer meeting back in 1993 in North Shore Baptist Church and a man, Charlie Volz, was teaching, one of the elders, a very good and godly man. There might be five people here and I'm looking at one of them who would know him. And he said something from the pulpit that like riveted me. He said, listen, I'm telling you, being a Christian is going to cost you. It's going to cost you money. It's going to cost you finances. It's going to cost you things. It's going to cost you, could cost you your job. It could cost you a promotion at your job. But why? Because you won't lie. You won't do anything that goes against conscience. And maybe it'll, it'll cost you uh, by having to give back something that you've taken in the past. Maybe it'll cost you because you're going to be fair and square on your taxes. But more than likely, following Christ is financially going to cost you. And I'm sure the saints at Smyrna wanted to provide for their families. And I'm sure they wanted to give their kids Game Boys and iPhones, 9, 10, 11, 12, whatever else is there now. And Air Jordan 12 retro wings or whatever those things are, kind of sneakers. And to send them to the better schools and to live in better neighborhoods. Right? I'm sure they wanted all of those things like everybody wants for their families, do they not? And if they would have denied Christ by saying Caesar is Lord, if they would have done that, or at least toned down their Christianity, so to speak, you know, compromise a little, make nice with the people of Smyrna, stop stirring up the Jews by telling them Jesus is the Messiah. Well, they might have been financially better off, but they wouldn't do that. They wouldn't do that. They'd rather live in poverty than deny the Lord. And as an aside, what does it say about the preachers and evangelists today that say God wants you to be rich? He wants you to be rich. All you have to do is claim it. Just claim it, and it's yours. And if you don't get it, it's because you don't have faith to get it. Is that what the Bible says? No. That's a false gospel. That's a false gospel. Well, the saints at Smyrna were extremely poor, poor, but then, in parentheses, we see these really amazing four words. And there we read, but you are rich. But you are rich. He just said you're dirt poor, but now he says you are rich. You are rich. But you're not rich in material things. You're, you're in abject poverty. But you are rich in spiritual things. Right? So they're, they're rich in faith. They're rich in good works. They're rich in the fruit of the Spirit. They are rich in Christian virtues. Right? And they're rich because they have treasures in heaven and a dwelling place waiting for them when they get there. And they have the spirit of the living God living in them and angels are ministering to them. And they are in the royal family of God, adopted kings and priests and a special people. And as Ephesians 1.3 says, they have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And as James 2.5 says, God has chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith. Rich in faith. And heirs, that means you're getting an inheritance of the kingdom. Their example of Proverbs 13.7, which says, There is one who makes himself rich, yet has nothing. And one who makes himself poor, yet has great riches. So the saints in Smyrna remind us of the saints in Macedonia, who were really very, very poor as well. But they were rich also, the Bible tells us. Right? In 2 Corinthians 8, uh, chapter 8, verse 2, Paul says to them, now he, here's the setup. Paul is, is collecting money. He's in Corinth, uh, a love offering that the saints have promised to give because the saints in Jerusalem were suffering from a famine. So he's going around and, and they're giving a love offering and Paul and others are going to take it down to, to Jerusalem. But the, the saints in Macedonia, they had nothing. And Paul uses them as an example. They are dirt, dirt poor. But they say, please let us give. Please let us donate to these poor saints. So here's what we read. 
right? Paul says of them, that in, in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. In other words, they were so joyful to be in the kingdom. They were so joyful to be able to serve and to give, even though they were dirt poor, they couldn't help but give to help the suffering saints in Jerusalem. It abounded in the riches of their liberality. So they joyfully gave to the suffering saints in Jerusalem, even though they were destitute. Thus they were rich in spiritual things. So Jesus says, even though they're very poor, the saints in, in Smyrna, they're actually very rich. In fact, they are rich beyond imagination. And that's the way Jesus sees them. That's what he declares them to be. And we need to ask, what would he declare Grace Baptist Church to be? And what would he declare you and me to be? What would he declare us to be? Would he say that we are spiritually rich? Would he say that I am a spiritually rich man? Would he say that you are a spiritually rich man or woman? Would he say that? Remember, he looks at things a whole lot different than men look at things. He looks at things a whole lot different than we look at things. He sees the secret places of the heart. He knows if we're rich towards him. He knows if our minds are set on things above as opposed to things on the earth. And as we can see from our text today, he's more concerned about the state of our souls than he is about the state of our finances. So what you think about him and what you, what, what you put into your mind, where your heart is, he knows. And the question becomes then, what would he say about you? What would he say about me? Because the last thing any of us want him to say about us is that we are spiritually poor, that we are spiritually destitute. Wouldn't want that. Well, in verse 9 he says, I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Blasphemy means to slander, and it usually means to slander God. But sometimes, as we see here, it is a slandering of God's people. Uh, and, and, and those doing the slandering are, are the Jews in Smyrna who are of the synagogue there. And they hate Christ, and they hate Christians, and they've been slandering Christians and stirring up persecutions against them since even Christ walked here as they certainly slandered him. And we can see the constant hounding of the Apostle Paul in his ministry. Just listen to a few of these verses. All in Acts. In Acts 14, 19 we read, Then the Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there, that is Lystra, and having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. A few chapters later, chapter 17, Paul and Silas are preaching in Thessalonica. And there we read, But the Jews, who were not persuaded, became envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace, and gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, and sought to bring them, that's Paul and Silas, out to the people. Eight verses later. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea, they came there also and stirred up the crowds. All right, we read concerning in Corinth in Acts 18, 12 and 13. Uh, it says there, The Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. So because of their hatred for Jesus and anger and wrath and jealousy and envy, the Jews slandered believers in Smyrna. And the things that they said about him, the things that they falsely accused him of, which caused the Gentiles to hate him as well, were things like this. They said, listen, these, these Christians, they're cannibals. They're cannibals. They like to eat flesh and to drink blood. And of course, this was a twist, tw twisting of and a misunderstanding of the Lord's table. They also said they engaged in sexual orgies because they heard that the Christians were involved in love feasts. But these love feasts were nothing more than, than fellowship gatherings. Fellowship gatherings. They also accused them of breaking up families. They accused these Christians of being anti-family. Because when someone got saved, oftentimes the unbeliever, well, they couldn't take it anymore. And they would leave the believer. And Jesus said that there would be division 
in homes, even because of him. In Luke 12, 51, he said, do, not, do, do, not, do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. And so we've seen that from the very get-go, and it happens today. And they were accused of being atheists because they, they didn't worship the many gods of the pagans, nor did they use statues and icons and things. So when a natural disaster would hit, well, they blamed the Christians for angering the gods because they didn't worship them. And lastly, they accused them of being political rebels, political rebels against Rome because they refused to worship Caesar and they refused to call him Lord. And you've got to know this. Every Roman citizen, everybody in, in the Roman Empire was required once a year to take incense into a temple and burn that incense to Caesar and then to say, Caesar is Lord. Caesar is Lord. And when they did that, they were then giving a, a document saying they did that, which affirmed their loyalty to Caesar. But the Christians, they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't do it. And so they didn't have the certificate. And maybe the Jews at Smyrna told the officials in Smyrna that the Christians were anarchists. They were disloyal to the beloved Rome and Caesar and plotting against them. Well, Jesus says they say they're Jews, but they're not. And what he is saying is they say they're the true people of God. They say they're the congregation of the Lord. And Jesus says they're not any of those things. They're not. You see, they thought because they were physical descendants of Abraham that they were the people of faith. But guess what? They rejected the Messiah. They crucified the Lord of glory. And because of that, their house was left to them desolate. Jesus said to the, to the Jewish people in, in John 8, 44, he said, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. So, so you, you, you desire evil, even as the devil desires evil. Paul said in, in Romans 2, 28 and 29, he said, he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. And he elaborates a little more. Seven chapters later in Romans 9, he says, For they are not all Israel who are of Israel nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. So what he's saying is, is, is the true Jew is the one who has been born again. That's the true Jew. That's the true Jew whose heart has been circumcised. It's not physical circumcision that makes you a true Jew. It is spiritual circumcision that makes you a true Jew who is a new creation in Christ, who has saving faith like Abraham had saving faith. So the Jews in Smyrna, they hated the Christians, so much so. So much so, we're told 60 years later, when Polycarp, who was the bishop at Smyrna, was going to be burned at the stake, the Jews went ahead and gathered the wood for the fire, and they did it on the Sabbath day. And no good Jew would ever be collecting wood on the Sabbath day. But they hated, they hated Polycarp and the Christians so much that they went and did it anyway. So the Jews are not God's people anymore. And Jesus called them a seriously, politically incorrect term. A term that the political police today would be sent into a tizzy. Right? He called them the synagogue of Satan. The synagogue of Satan. He's saying this. You are governed by Satan. You are under Satan's influence. Not the Holy Spirit's. And listen, every religious meeting place that does not preach the gospel, that does not worship Christ above all, that does not believe in Christ as Lord and Savior, is a place run by Satan. Oh, it's so hard, Pastor. You say hard things. Listen, if the gospel is twisted or tainted or missing, then that assembly, under the authority of what I'm reading now, is an assembly of Satan. He's running it. And we're going to see some of that in the, next, in the next point. And that is the caution for Smyrna, verse 10a. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And you will have tribulation 10 days. All right? So the caution here is don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, but know this. 
more suffering is coming, even intense suffering. And you know what? Suffering is not popular. And it certainly is not popular in the church, but it is given by God for our good. It is part of what it means to follow Christ and to be united with him. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 22, that you will be hated by all for my name's sake. He said that. And then Paul says in Philippians 1, 29, it has been granted or graced on behalf of Christ, not only, not only that you believe in him, but also, in conjunction with that, you suffer for his sake. It's a gift. Suffering is a gift from God. So Jesus says, don't fear, because the first and the last is in control. Don't fear Satan, because the one who was dead and is alive has defeated him already. He was crushed at the cross. Don't be put to flight. Instead, take courage, because Christ has power and authority over everything. Thus, more suffering is coming to the church. That already has suffered much, right? And, 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 and already was a faithful church. And the question is, why more suffering for Smyrna? Why more persecution for a church that is faithful, right? Why not a time of peace and prosperity and, and, and ease? Why not a time of that? And the answer is this, because that's not the Lord's will for them. That is not the Lord's will for them. And also the Lord uses suffering and he uses persecution to burn away impurities, if you will. He uses those things to shape and to mold his people more into his own image. And that's what he's after. He's after making us more like him. He uses, he uses it to teach them to depend on him wholly and to oust any idols from their hearts. So from his perspective, persecution refines the church. And it grows the church. It's kind of like what barbells do for your muscles. Now listen, I don't like barbells, and I don't really use them anyway. And, and I know guys that do use like weights and stuff. It's never fun and it always hurts. But the result is muscles. That's what suffering does. It never feels good, but it grows us and makes us more holy. Peter put it this way in 1 Peter 1. He said, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Why? That the, gentle, that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Not to make you holy. Prepare you for glory. Paul said it this way in Romans 8, 16 and 17. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs of Christ, if, qualifier, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So suffering for Jesus' sake grows us and it assures us that we're his and we're in his family. One commentator said, we flourish best and are richest when we suffer. Therefore, suffering for Christ's sake is a privilege and not a sorrow. In Philippians 3.10, Paul said he wanted to know the power of Jesus' resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Why? To be conformed to his death. I want to live like Christ. I need to die to self more and more. I want to live like Christ. In Romans in Romans chapter 8, uh, we know, even as I think Dylan said today, or, or Phil said it, that all things work together for good to those, uh, to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. All things work together for good, even the struggles and the, and the trials and the persecution and the suffering and the mishaps and all of those. They work together for good for the believer, and thus they glorify God. And then Jesus describes the suffering. He says, indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. So though the Gentiles and the Jews are the ones physically inflicting the suffering upon the saints, ultimately, he says it's from Satan, right? He's persecuting Jesus' people by stirring up people against them. That's what he does. That's what he does. It's his game plan to get them to deny Jesus, to get them, the Christian, to walk away from Jesus, to be angry with him, to accuse him and to be crippled in their witness for him. So behind the human evil is the master of evil himself, the wicked one. 
And he's the one that put, put it in Judas' heart to betray Jesus the night of the Last Supper. He's the one to ask Jesus if he could sift Peter his wheat the night of Jesus' arrest. He's the one who asked God to allow him to afflict Job, certain that Job would, be, would deny God if he did so. And he's the one who afflicted Paul with a thorn in the flesh. And here we see both God and Satan are involved in this, in this thorn in the flesh, but for different reasons. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3, we see Paul is caught up into paradise or the third heaven. Then he says in verse 7, And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to do what? To buffet me. Why? Lest I be exalted above measure. So here's what he's saying. I've been in heaven. I've seen and heard things. I'm not even allowed to tell you. And quite honestly, I can't tell you anyway. I don't understand it. It's so glorious. But now I'm back here. And I'm back here with you chickens. And I'm back here with, with sinners and struggles and everything else. And it would be very easy for me to be so proud that I've been where no man has been before and back to tell you about it. Right? It would be very easy for me to think I'm better than you. Well, not tolerate you anymore because... You're still going in circles with your sin. So to keep me from being exalted over you, to keep me from pride, the Lord has deemed it best that I would have this thorn in the flesh, that I not think well of myself because I've been where you haven't been. And I've seen what you haven't seen. And I've heard what you haven't heard. So God gave him the thorn in the flesh. But he used Satan to administer it. The thorn was purposed by God to keep Paul humble since where he had been, which is heaven, and saw and heard those things which no one else had. But Satan, Satan delivers the thorn not to humble Paul, but to get him to curse God, to get him to blame God, and to complain against God. And you, quite honestly, humanly speaking, like who would, who would have a problem with Paul complaining? I mean, he is the great apostle. He is the great church planter. He is the great evangelist. He is writing more books of the Bible than anybody else. And so clearly... You don't want to have a thorn in the flesh is Paul. You want him to have room. You want to cater to him. We want him to have ease and comfort as much as possible so he can keep doing what he's doing. And it would be easy for Paul to think, I'm, I'm doing more than the other apostles. And he does say that, by the way, but not I, but the grace of God that was in me. I'm, I'm doing more than everybody, and, and I'm the last guy, Lord, that should have this thorn. Why would you give this to me? Right? Wouldn't you say that? I'm the pastor, Lord. Why do I have these problems? Don't do that, though. That's what Satan wants. That's what Satan wants. Satan wants him to complain. Satan wants him to say, how is this possible that, that I should get this thorn? But Satan wants it. He wants it for, 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 for Paul's demise. He wants it. He'll complain against God. So God sends the thorn for Paul's good, and Satan gives it to him for his demise. Thus, God uses Satan to fulfill his own ends. While well, Satan is hoping that the suffering and the persecution of the saints at Smyrna would lead them to cave in, to quit, to abandon ship. So he says, the devil is going to throw some of you into prison. And I think prison here literally means prison. You know, when it, in that day, in that day in the Roman Empire, when someone went to prison, when Rome's upon in prison, it was really for one of two reasons. It was not to reform them. Oh, put this guy in the slammer for five years. We'll reform this guy. He comes out, he'll be a better citizen. It was not to do that. It was not to slap him on the wrist. It was for one of two reasons. One, to beat him silly until he gives you information on other people. Or two, a holding pen until you put him on a cross and crucify him. That was it. It was not you're going to be there for 50 years. You're only going to be there a short time. So prison was a whole different ballgame in those days than it is today. Not like that. This is why I think the writer of Hebrews says in 13.3, remember the prisoners as if chained with them those who are mistreated. I think these are the believers who are suffering for Christ's sake. Remember them because it's brutal. Well, Jesus, some of you are going to be uh, put into prison and to be tested. And this wasn't so the Lord could figure out what they would do. All right, I'll put them in prison and I'll see what they'll do. He knows exactly what everyone's going to do every second of our lives. He knows our thoughts before we think them. But it was so the saints would know what they would do. That they would know what they're made of. You see, testing, trials, teach us what we're made of. They show us the stuff that's in us. Yeah.
You know, it's easy to think all is well with your soul when life is going good, is it not? Things are going good. I'm physically good. Finances are okay. Relationships going good. Everybody loves me. I love everybody. No problems. Things are good. I love Jesus. But what happens when things go south? What happens when illness hits? What happens when financial disaster hits? What happens when a relationship blows up? What happens? What happens when you're being persecuted at work? Right? What do you do? What do you do? Right? Uh, what happens? Well, then you see where you really stand. And if you persevere, guess what? It's an assurance that you're his. But if you bail out, well, maybe you're not really a genuine believer. Listen, a soldier can train and train and train for years to prepare for battle. But he doesn't really know. He doesn't really know how he'll act in battle until he's in a battle. Well, some of the saints would be thrown into prison, he says. And they will have tribulation for 10 days. And there are a lot of ideas of what the 10 days means here. Some say it's 10 periods of persecution. So from the first century to the fourth century, 10 periods of persecution. Some say the 10 days equals 10 years. Some say the 10 days is actually a figure of speech and it just means a, a, a set period of time. Some say 10 days actually means 10 days, literally. My answer is, I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know, because he doesn't say. But however long it is, we know this, it's gonna be hard and it's going to be terrible suffering, and the saints have it coming their way. Now let me say that, that this kind of church is the kind of church that Satan loves to attack. Why? Because they're faithful. Because they're faithful. They don't back down. Right? They don't budge on being committed to Christ. Right? They don't budge on, on, uh, on, on, on the truth. They don't budge on sharing the gospel. They don't budge. And the truth is that Satan really doesn't need to attack a lot of churches because they're already serving his purposes in this world. They already compromise with sin. They already compromise the word of God. They already have a focus that's not Christward, but it's other things word. It's man word. It's money word. It's spiritual gifts word. It's money word. It's power word. It's world recognition word. But it's not Christward. And he already has men and women in the pulpits. And it's a sad thing that he has women in the pulpits, but he does. He already has men and women in the pulpits. Listen to 2 Corinthians 11, 14 and 15. And remember this. Listen what it says. Paul's defending his apostleship and showing that there were false apostles that had crept into Corinth. And he's, he's hammering them through 2 Corinthians. And we get to 11 and he says this. For Satan himself, but Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. He looks like the real deal. He looks like, like, like the real deal, like a Christian. He's, he's mimicking the Holy Spirit. Therefore, it is no great thing, it is no great thing if his ministers, if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness. Do you see what he's saying? He's saying guys like me who preach the gospel or preach, and guys like Pastor Steve who preach and teach and fill and others, oh, they they. They think they're sincere, but they're not bringing the gospel. They're working for Satan. They're his ministers. You understand there are people in pulpits all over America right now as I stand up and preach to you that are preaching another gospel. And if there's any other gospel, Paul says in Galatians 1, let that place be anathema, condemned, accursed, literally go to hell. So he's got ministers preaching and teaching everywhere. And I need to attack those places. He's got them. They're in the pocket. It's like payola to the police or the detectives or something. You know what I mean? They're paying them off. No one, they turn, turn a blind eye. They're already there. So the question is this. How would you feel? Now think about this. How would you feel if you knew that Satan wasn't interested in attacking Grace Baptist Church? How would you feel? If you knew he had no interest in us at all? You feel good about that? How would you feel if, if it wasn't worth his time to persecute us? It wasn't worth his time. Now, that's an interesting question, right? Because who wants persecution? I wouldn't feel good about that. Really? But I'm not looking for pain and suffering, honestly, either. But I wouldn't feel good about that because it says we're not living 
We're not living and preaching and teaching what Christ has commanded. We're not Christward. We're manward. If he wouldn't want to persecute us, and I'm not, you know, calling him down here, but I, but I, wouldn't, I wouldn't feel good about that. Pastor Steve, I don't think you would feel good about that. I think Spurgeon said this, I'm not sure. He said, a pirate only goes after the ship with the most treasure. So if you've got a treasure chest with only a couple of coins in it, on one ship and a treasure chest filled to overflowing with coins in it, which one's the pirate going to go for? Going for the one with all the coins. Satan's going for the church that's preaching the gospel and living the gospel. And they may be poor, and that's part of his doing too, I'm sure, but they're rich, persecuting them. And I can tell you that we've had a wrestle with him some over the years. We've had some wolves in sheep's clothing in this place. We've had our fair share of divisive people wanting to tear down the work of God that was going on in this place. We've had some troublemakers seeking to hurt the people of God from the inside and from the outside. And I'm sure we've we're, we're, we're got more coming, and if not already, it's coming. But he who is the first and the last has kept us and will keep us. So we see the comfort for Smyrna, the caution for Smyrna, and now the charge to Smyrna in verses 10b and 11. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Well, Jesus says some of you guys are going to suffer severe persecution. But then he says, be faithful unto death. With the promise that those who are, will they'll be received or will be given the crown of life. So be faithful unto death. Even if you die in prison, or whether you live another 50 years, be faithful. Keep trusting Christ no matter what. Keep worshiping Christ. Keep following him and keep obeying his word regardless of how intense the persecution gets. Don't deny him. Even though you are under heavy persecution and pressure to do so, be faithful. Be faithful. Even if it means losing your life. And odds are none of us in this room, none of us in this room are going to have to make this choice. Well, if I don't say I believe in Christ, you know, this madman is going to shoot me in the head. Odds are that's not going to happen here. Right? We're not going to have to fulfill this command in this land, odds are. But plenty, plenty of our brothers and sisters will have to do that, especially in Isl Islamic countries. Look at those two posters sitting up there. They suffer severely. They suffer severely physically. Augustine said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Job said, though he slay me, I will not deny him. I will trust in him. Though he slay me, I will trust. So be faithful unto death. And this is the charge. The charge is faithfulness. And we have to ask ourselves, are we faithful to him? Are our lives characterized by faithfulness? Or is it characterized by waffling or compromise? Jesus calls us to exercise supernatural faithfulness to him until death. And he gives us the grace to do it. This isn't something we muster up. He wants us to be faithful every day he gives us till he calls us home. He expects faithfulness, faithfulness in doctrine, faithfulness in practice. He expects it. You see, listen, here's what he's not asking for. He is not asking for success. He is not asking for, I want 25 baptisms this year, and I want 60 decision cards filled out this year, 218. That's what I want. No. I want faithfulness. I want faithfulness. And if faithfulness means no baptisms, praise the Lord. If faithfulness means five baptisms, praise the Lord. If faithfulness means that saints go from here to here, praise the Lord. That's faithfulness. Right? And we see that with the, with the Bishop of Polycarp. Not only did they burn him at the stake, but they gave him the option. They gave him the get out of jail free card. Just deny Jesus and say, say Caesar is Lord, we'll let you go. We'll free you, Polycarp. What are you going to sit there and burn at the stake for? And he said, and I paraphrase, 80 and 6 years I've been trusting him, and he's never let me down. He's never betrayed me. How could I speak out against my Lord? Amen. And he burned at the stake. So then, be faithful until the Lord calls you to himself and gives you the crown of life. And the crown of life just means eternal life. It's another way of saying, I will give you to eat of the tree of life. And we see this promise of a crown in a few places in the New Testament. It's called the crown of life in James 1. 
It's called the crown of righteousness in 2 Timothy 4. It's called an imperishable crown, 1 Corinthians 9. It's called the crown of glory in 1 Peter 5. All right? And all to say eternal life. And remember I said in the beginning that the city of Smyrna was called the crown city. The crown city because of the hills that were around it made it look like a crown. Uh, but these hills will one day perish as everything in the rest of this world will. But the crown that Christ gives you lives forever. It is a crown that can never be taken away. The glory you have with Christ can never be taken away. Well, the saints at Smyrna would one day have the crown of life and that would not fade away. You see, death, death would only be a transition for them. They would go from carrying the cross to wearing the crown. That's it, cross the crown, cross the crown, figuratively speaking. So he who is faithful or endures to the end ends up with Jesus in glory. Thus, the crown of life would encourage the suffering saints because it means the suffering is only for a season. The pain and the poverty is only in this life. And quite honestly, you know as well as I, this life is pretty short. Uh, but if your faith is real, you will endure. And in the end, Jesus will crown you with the crown of life. And then he says in verse 11, he who is alive and can, and, and, and can discern spiritual things, hear what the Spirit says to the churches, that he who overcomes, he who walks the walk in spite of trials and sufferings, and all kinds of persecution and poverty, they will not be hurt by the second death. And the second death is what the Bible calls the lake of fire. We read in Revelation 20, verse 14, then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Then in verse 15, it says, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Move on one chapter more, Revelation 21, 8, but the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So it's, it's not just bad people, uh, the bad people of this world who are going to end up in the lake of fire or the second death, but all unredeemed sinners. That's it. All unredeemed sinners. Guess what? One sin... One sin, James 2.10 says, qualifies you for the lake of fire. Even one sin makes you a rebel and an outlaw and an outcast from, from the presence of God. Even one sin means you need a savior. And we are a sin factory. Our minds, our hearts, our words, our, our, our deeds, we just we bowl it over. We just spill it out. Hatred, anger, jealousy, greed, lusting, name, and, that, 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 and the list is long. And so it's for all unbelievers. But Revelation 26 says that the second death has no power over born again believers. It has no power. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. And that's because they were in the first resurrection which would be the bringing of, of their souls to life. When they were regenerated, when they were born again, they were given a new heart, and they were made spiritually alive in Christ. Thus, they will never experience the second death, or they will never experience God's judgment for sin. Why? Why won't they experience that? Because Jesus has already experienced it for them. Jesus has already suffered the second death for them. That's why. He has suffered God's wrath for their sin and their eternal damnation while he was on the cross. So for the believer, his first resurrection, that was a spiritual resurrection, that was when he was born again. That was when he was, was, was regenerated, made alive. And his second resurrection will be a physical one, when his body is raised from the grave to meet his already glorified, resurrected soul in heaven, to become one glorified, resurrected person as Jesus is even this day. So then, Christians only die once, but they're born twice. They only die once. They may suffer hell on earth, if you will, so to speak, but they will never suffer hell in eternity. There is no second death for them. If you are a born-again believer today, you cannot die the second death because Jesus died it for you. But for the unbeliever, the cowardly, the unbelieving, that's anybody who doesn't believe in Jesus, the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sexually immoral. That's sex outside of marriage, guys. 
sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, anything you love more than Jesus. How about all liars? You ever lie? Every one of them will die twice. They will die the physical death, and they will die the second death eternally in a place called the lake of fire. So one birth, two deaths. Two births, two births, one death. If you're born physically and then born spiritually, born again, one death. Listen, you may not be good at math. Some of you are not. I'm okay on some things. But if you ever got an equation right, this is it. Two births equal one death. One birth equals two deaths. That's what you need to know. And if you're only sitting right now in the one birth, you're looking at two deaths. If by God's grace you have the two birds, well, you're looking at one death. No second death for the saints at Smyrna, but rather a crown of life, uh, which would have been a massive, massive encouragement to them. Uh, but this should be a terrible horror for anyone who's not in Christ, who rejects Christ, who is apart from Christ. Your only hope is to cling to the one who, has been, who, is, who, who came to save sinners, the one who was born that man no more may die, born to raise the sons of earth, born to give him, them second birth. We were just saying that like a couple of weeks ago, right, Dylan? Second birth. Talk to Harold angels, sing. That's why he came. Born that man no more may die. That's the second death. Born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. Well, let me close by saying the charge to every believer here is to be faithful. To be faithful until the Lord takes you home whenever that is. And I don't know what you're going through today. I don't know what's trying you or tempting you or what maybe is troubling you or the struggles you're going through or what you're dealing with. But I know that Christ knows. I know that Jesus knows. And I know that he loves you and that he cares for you. And I know that he has the power to change it if that's his will. And if not, he has enough grace to make it very sufficient for you to glorify him even through it. Because he is the first and the last. And, and he is God in the flesh, the one who was dead and came to life. And, and he knows a thing or two about suffering. So then the power that raised him to life is the same power, the same power available, available to you right now to live victoriously for him in this life and to be crowned as a victor in the next life. And the next life is the one you are really wanting to think about if you're not a Christian this day. You really want to be thinking about the next life because because you still haven't died yet the, the first death. You're here. By God's grace and God's mercy, your heart is still beating and you're here. So why, why then live this life with the fear and the knowledge that you will suffer the second death? Have an ear to hear what the Spirit says to you today. Recognize you are a sinner before the one who is the first and the last. Recognize that your sin has earned you the second death. Recognize that and pray to the one who died the second death for all those who would put their faith and trust and hope in him. And if you do, if you do uh, know that whatever this life brings, whatever this life brings, the next one is going to bring a crown. If you do, come to Christ. Trust in Christ. Don't, don't leave this world being born just once. Let's pray as the ushers come forward. Lord, thank you, Lord, for the example of, of this suffering, faithful church. Lord, I pray that we would be a faithful church no matter what we would suffer. I pray that Christ would be preeminent in all ways, all the time. In our own lives, Lord, help us to live for him. Help us not to complain when things don't go our way. Help us to see your sovereign, providential hand working in our lives to grow us and to shape us into that glorious image of your Son. And Lord, for, this, for those sitting here this day who don't know Christ, who have not been born again, who are looking at the second death, please have mercy on their souls. Please, Lord, give them your fear, fear of you. Drive them to you. Drive them to your Son. Drive them to the cross that they would cry out and cling to the Savior of souls. And may they find mercy at the cross. And Lord, now as we take this offering, I pray that we would give it with a good and cheerful and generous heart. Oh Lord, you have given us everything. Lord, may we support the work of your ministry. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.